So now it is my very great pleasure to introduce Dr. Alison Wiley. Dr. Wiley is a professor of philosophy at the University of British Columbia and holds a chair, um, Canada Research Chair in Philosophy of the Social and Historical Sciences. Dr. Wiley's research focuses on epistemic issues raised by archaeological work in the field and feminist research, as well as on questions of accountability to those affected by historical and social research. Currently, she is part of the Indigenous Science Project, an interdisciplinary research cluster composed by four faculties and 12 university departments, as well as representatives of several First Nations. And the idea is to develop partnership and address issues relevant to the communities. Mm -hmm. So please, Alison, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And thanks to everybody who has shown up and really warm thanks to all you organizers who have made this series possible. It's just wonderful to see, uh, to see such a series take shape and, and have access to the presentations online. So to, I want to start with a land acknowledgement. Um, in UBC, uh, or at UBC in Vancouver, where I live and work, um, I'm located, the university is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. Now, this acknowledgement is not just a formality. In a sense, it's what this whole presentation is about. So I want to take a moment to consider what's at stake in each of its elements. Traditional marks the fact that these lands have been the home of Musqueam people for millennia. Um, we who are settlers are in effect uninvited guests and the Musqueam are our hosts. Ancestral recognizes that this land has been handed down within Musqueam uh, community from generation to generation, subject to governance, indigenous governance systems that define social and relational responsibilities to care for the land. More specifically, the formal land acknowledgement that was developed by Musqueam and UBC goes on to say, this land has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam, who for millennia have passed on their culture, history, and traditions from one generation to the next on this site. Unseated means exactly what it sounds like, that these lands, Musqueam territory, and virtually all territories that make up present day British Columbia were not turned over to uh, the Crown by treaty or any other agreement. Now this last is significant because under a Royal Proclamation of 1763, the Crown specified that British settlers would have to address existing, pre-existing Aboriginal rights and title before they could occupy land, exploit resources and more basically settle. Legal and political and scholarly debate has been ongoing about whether historic uh, treaties settled in other parts of Canada are binding whether they expunge uh, various pre-existing rights to self-determination. Violations of the rights they do affirm are legion and ongoing, but in British Columbia, such treaties were not negotiated. Um, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is a component of the 1982 Canadian Constitution Act, uh, includes sections that, to quote it, recognize and affirm Aboriginal rights and freedoms. Uh, those rights and freedoms established by the 18th century Royal Pro Proclamation, but they provide little guidance as to which rights these are and how they should be interpreted. At the direction of the Supreme Court, British Columbia, as uh, the province of British Columbia is engaged, has been engaged for the last 20 years or so in treaty negotiations uh, with indigenous communities uh, whose territories make up British Columbia or British Columbia is made up of their territories. In the contours of, of Aboriginal rights, the Aboriginal is a term of, of law and governance, um, the contours of Aboriginal rights and freedoms are otherwise being set by legal precedent in a series of provincial and federal Supreme Court decisions, which are, um, have, <laughs> move in several different directions. It's a long and complicated story, how, how the, these legal, what kinds of precedent are being set. Contestation is especially intense around land claims. Um, oh, hold on a second. Um, is especially intense around land claims um, for the restitution of land and recognition of indigenous rights and responsibilities in traditional and ancestral territories. I should have shared screen before now. Let me do that. 
And what you're looking at here <coughs> is the foreshore um, uh, at Musqueam, the reservation lands that Musqueam holds, which are just, um, just south and west of uh, the UBC property. Huh, why is this not? Oh, okay, there we go. Um, this is broadly the plan I'm going to follow, but I'll, I'll, I'll mention this as I go along. Um, and here, here is, um, th this is the uh, sort of official land acknowledgement. The image to the left shows the Museum of Anthropology at UBC and all of that property, the promontory surrounding it is um, endowment lands UBC, but it's all Musqueam territory. And the two-headed serpent pole is on one of the main malls on campus. It's a musk by a Musqueam carver and it represents a Musqueam um, a story about Musqueam traditional uh, um, ancestral relation to this place. So I wanna start with settler colonial legacies. In this context, um, this Canadian context and British Columbia context, Indigenous scholars and advocates for uh, sovereignty, um, advocating Indigenous sovereignty, frequently make the point that it's crucial to specify what kind of colonialism you're dealing with. If you're to understand what decolonization means, what it requires, and what we're dealing with here is internal colonialism. Settlers come to stay, not just to appropriate land and human resources, but to occupy Indigenous lands. Uh, a process, uh, this is a process that required literally uh, removing indigenous peoples and or declaring their lands terra nullius by legal fiat, imposing legal and governmental regimes that redefine collectively held and managed territories and resources as property that can be um, broken up and owned individually, instituting technologies of governance that enact what is often described as an imperative of elimination. Epistemicide, to, uh, I'm, I'm invoking here the term the way it's used by Veli Matova in her recent paper, is one set such technology which in a Canadian context was enacted through the Indian residential school system. This system was designed to eradicate uh, lang uh, Indigenous languages, inculcate Christian and Euro-Canadian values, break down, deliberately break down connections of Indigenous children to families and communities. <clears throat> excuse me, in the process undermining traditional knowledge systems and ancestral governance regimes. The goal was explicitly, as one commissioner had put it uh, early in the 20th century, was to kill the Indian in the child. That's Duncan Campbell Scott, who oversaw the, res the IRS, the in Indian residential school system from 1913 to 1932. But as Thomas King puts it in The Inconvenient Indian, a book he published in 2012, indigenous peoples didn't disappear and weren't altogether assimilated. From the 70s on, a growing stream of legal suits and increasingly high profile activism drew attention to the brutality of the IRS system. In the settlement of some of these claims, uh, some of the legal uh, cases, the Canadian Supreme Court mandated a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to produce a report that, as they put it, would tell the complete story of the residential school system. It was published in 2015. It covers a century long history of abduction and institutionalized abuse of indigenous children that the TRC concluded could only be described as a deliberate program of cultural genocide. In the event, Pache Duncan Campbell Scott, the IRS schools did routinely kill both the child and the Indian acknowledged mortality rates in reports dating to 1907, 1909 were between 30 and 60% in the Western provinces. Um, this was uh, in a study uh, commissioned at the time that sharply criticized the residential school system but brought no change. In fact, it was expanded after that point. So this uh, to the left, there's some details about the history of the IRS system. To the left is a, another poll that was raised on UBC campus um, around the time that the Truth and Reconciliation Commission report was delivered. And it shows, um, an, it has an image or a carving of a residential school and above it, uh, images of children surrounding it. Here's a close up of some of those children, including one who's essentially 
you know, been ha has none of his um, traditional dress, doesn't have, is not assimilated. The, um, the brass, uh, what you can see the brass um, nails uh, on the face of the school below the children. There's one for each child who was recognized by the TRC report, in the TRC report, to have died in residential school custody. You can't see this very well. It's very hard to get a picture of it. But looking from the bottom, uh, looking up to the bottom of the residential school building sculptures that are on either side of the pole is a, is a skeleton um, indicating just how, how many children were lost and how brutal the system was. Um, the TRC report had been published just a couple of years before I returned to Canada, and I was shocked to realize how little I'd been aware of, the, of this history. These residential schools had been running the entire time I was growing up and going to school to college. If I knew anything about them, what I did know about um, colonial violence against Indigenous people was largely characterized as a thing of the past. Um, so this history had been <clears throat> effectively invisibilized the harms borne by indigenous communities cast as health issues rather than issues that required le legal address, restitution. Legal challenges were deflected until they just couldn't be contained. The process of gathering testimony and several of the calls to action issued by the TRC ensure, I hope, that no one growing up in Canada will be as ignorant as I was. And I take this to be a positive outcome. At the same time, however, many indigenous communities, scholars, activists are profoundly disillusioned by the TRC process and persistent failures to move beyond uh, what they describe as truth telling. Uh, and often the point made is that indigenous people were called on to tell the truth <laughs> and nothing much was done about this. They raise issues that bear directly on the question of what counts as decolonization what it requires, especially in a settler colonial context. So a colleague at UBC, Michelle Daigle, describes the TRC as a spectacle of rec reconciliation orchestrated by the Canadian state in a series, and I'm quoting her here, of unrelenting performances of indigenous suffering and trauma, unquote, alongside settler performances of recognition, mourning, and remorse. Indigenous testimony is rendered in ways that reify, as she puts it, a unified Indian subject as suffering, wounded, angry, and that often recenter, uh, these performances often recenter attention on settler anxieties. They become confessional spaces of white, white guilt uh, or hollow recitations of acknowledgement. She's quite critical of the way land acknowledgements are often just rushed through as a formality with no you know, no real engagement. The effect, Degla argues, has been to relegate this sad chapter in Canadian history, that's a quote from the then Prime Minister Stephen Harper, to relegate this sad chapter to the past, erasing continuity with ongoing practices of colonial dispossession and violence, containing them within the history of the residential schools. The spectacle of reconciliation, she argues, depoliticizes settler indigenous relations. It fails to address ongoing structural conditions of oppression or redress past wrongs in substantive terms. Specifically, it makes no move toward restoring land or in indigenous jurisdiction, traditional jurisdiction over ancestral territories. Far from, uh, this is a, again a quote from her, activating a commitment to establish responsible relations with indigenous peoples who currently experience the effects of colonial power. Degla argue, concludes that the TRC process ultimately served to, quoting her again, secure, legitimate and reproduce white supremacy and settler futurity in Canada. Her conclusion, indigenous self-determination lies in the autonomy to remain unreconciled. Before the TRC report appeared, another colleague at UBC, Glenn Couthard, um, in, in a book, Red, Redskins, White Masks, 2014, laid out a, in, a, an uncompromising indictment of calls for reconciliation as enacting an empty politics of recognition. Uh, putting the, he, he, in effect, is putting the TRC process in historical context, showing in concrete terms how the sovereignty of the Canadian state had at every turn been given priority or taken precedence over uh, 
claims of sovereignty and rights to self-determination of indigenous nations. Read in light of Eve Tuck and Wayne Yang's 2012 decolonization is not a metaphor, TRC calls for reconciliation are figured as uh, just another strategy of, or could be seen as just another strategy of settler evasion. Moves to innocence is the term they use. Um, they're essentially political epistemic maneuvers that, as they put it, rescue settler normalcy. Um, they serve to deflect challenges that could unsettle settler futurity. Tuck and Wang insist that decolonization must be material and they especially object to metaphorical uses of the term that assimilate indigenous claims to broader social justice movements, the redistribution of wealth, for example, where wealth is rooted in land that uh, has been in, in, in settler indigenous context has been stolen from, uh, um, from, uh, in, from indigenous peoples. And they're sharply critical of appeals to a mutuality of suffering that would displace responsibility in this context. They too insist that decolonization must be material. Um, and, and they uh, insist that anti-imperial, or I should say, as, as they insist that decolonization must be material, they, they argue that uh, it must be pursued and, and engaged in, in, lo in, in local specific terms, terms appropriate to a particular context. Anti-imperial imperial struggles may be connected, but decolonial struggles, they say, are not parallel, equally shared, and do not bring closure to the concerns of all. Um, in a kind of cautionary note with respect to what I'm going to go on to describe, they make the point that if alliances and solidarities are to be found, they should be informed not by a presumption of common interest, but by what they describe as an ethic of incommensurability grounded in a recognition of difference of interest and, and positioning. Lasting solidarities, they say, will be elusive. They may even be undesirable. Collaborations, to quote them again, can only ever be strategic and contingent. Now the epistemic dimensions of these evasions and moves to innocence will be obvious. Degla in her critique of the spectacle of reconciliation in Canada particularly focuses her attention on universities and the academy generally as a primary locus of the production and legitimation of the conceptual regimes that underpin settler state systems of governance and technologies of oppression. Archaeology, the field that I primarily study as a philosopher of science, has always played a central role in these struggles, especially uh, with respect to the politics of memory and the systematic erasure of indigenous history, identity, experience, continuity of ancestry in home territories that are centrally at issue in the struggle over the TRC. One brief, I want to invoke one brief example returning to Musqueam. Um, to illustrate this, for, and it's from the history of Musqueam, the engagement of the Musqueam people with archaeology, as documented by historian Susan Roy in a book called These Mysterious People. It was first published in uh, 2010, um, but it was updated with a lot of input from uh, the Musqueam in 2016. There's a second edition. I recommend it if you're interested. Um, Roy traces the history of archaeological interest in what has been typically referred to as a Marpole Midden. <clears throat> Musqueam Cessnaam is a, it's actually a, a, an enormous and enormously rich and expansive uh, Musqueam settlement. Cessnaam um, is, is its um, Holcumelum name. Um, this, you know, a midden, I mean, the, 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 um, the Musqueam strongly object to referring to Marpole as a midden or to Cessna Am as a midden, midden typically meaning like a garbage dump or pile. Uh, it is actually, um, as I say, a settlement, but also a burial site, a sacred site. It's at least 4,000 years old, dates from somewhere between 3,000 and 2,400 BP. It's now a Canadian heritage site, but it has been badly damaged uh, over the years, even after it was declared a heritage site. It's certainly always been understood by the Musqueam to have been continuously occupied until the community was decimated by smallpox in the early to mid 19th century. Susan Roy focuses on the role of uh, the earliest archeological excavations in the early to mid, uh, in the, oh, sorry, in the late 19th century. Um, 
the central import and on the central importance of Cessna Am as a regional or, or Marpole as a regional uh, type, site type, made famous by uh, Charles Borden's mid century salvage excavations. Borden, um, the Borden system of site recording is the Canadian federal system for maintaining records of, of archaeologically significant sites. Uh, he was instrumental in um, kind of what's the word, institutionalizing, regularizing archaeological practice in Canada in, in, the, in, the, in the mid century, mid 20th century. Um, the crucial point here is that, um, is the interpretive history that by mid 20th century had entrenched a racialist answer to the question, the title of Susan Roy's book, who were these mysterious people? That, that was the, uh, who are these mysterious people was the, the he headline of an article in, I believe it was the Ottawa uh, newspaper in 1948. Um, so it was like a mystery. Who could these people be? The, the question itself uh, reflects prior work based on craniometry. Um, the argument was that the round headed population currently uh, that uh, the Musqueam and, themselves, but at later occupants of the site must have displaced a more kind of pointy headed population, an original population. Um, this argument is now discredited. I'd be happy to talk about how, how it was discredited, why this craniometry based uh, this distinction was drawn originally. Um, but the point that Roy makes is that this became a civic narrative that effectively dissociated the Musqueam from this ancestral heritage, this highly significant uh, settlement uh, site and, and their, their ancestral presence in the region. Much of the site was destroyed when a hotel was constructed in the 1950s, but it, it was essentially um, you know, undeveloped after the hotel um, was abandoned. In, the 20, in, in 2012, I believe it was, uh, there were sustained Musqueam protests uh, against the revoc you know, that resulted in the revocation of a development permit that would have destroyed the remaining burial ground and ancestral remains. In the end, they had to buy back the land, but they are now in a position to protect the site and memorialize the ancestors buried there. So um, to move uh, on to consider uh, counter-colonial practices in archaeology with this kind of history firmly in view. I always return to Vine Deloria. He opens a chapter uh, on anthropologists and other friends in Custer Died for Your Sins with this famous passage. Into each life, it is said, some rain must fall. Some people have bad horoscopes. Others take tips on the stock market. He has a long list of other misguided and unfortunate things that people were doing in the 60s. This book was published in 69. But Indians have been cursed above all other people in history. Indians have anthropologists. And he goes on to lay out his famous indictment of anthropology. Archaeologists have been, uh, archaeology as a field has been especially problematic, predicated as with the anthropology Deloria was cr criticizing, predicated on uh, the eliminationist logic of salvage anthropology, indigenous peoples in this context in North America had disappeared or were rapidly disappearing. Uh, anthropologists, archaeologists should do everything they can to salvage you know, the surviving evidence of these peoples. Um, and in the case of archaeology, the research that results, the traditions of research that resulted were not only intrusive and extractive, but also destructive, sometimes in ways that represent a profound violation of indigenous norms and stewardship obligations, for example, with respect to uh, burial sites, ancestral sites. By the 1970s, um, worldwide, certainly there had been ongoing protests long before that, but by the 70s, indigenous people, peoples were contesting these assumptions and practices with increasing, increasing success. Uh, indigenous activists in settler states were intent on regaining their cultural heritage and won a number of significant legal battles, especially with respect to the repatriation of human remains as mandated in, new, uh, in the US under NAGPRA, the Native American Grave Protection Repatriation Act of 1990. 
Um, that legislation and legislation in other settler states has fundamentally changed the uh, conditions under which archaeologists, physical anthropologists, and museums now operate. Um, in, and, and of course, in post or neo-colonial contexts, regulatory systems were put in place that um, go those governments would control in various ways access to archaeological sites and would repatriate and manage cultural patrimony. Um, legal, these legally mandated systems of accountability uh, and, and control of heritage took different forms, but gave rise to a move within archaeology to call for decolonization of the field in a broad range of senses. I, I note um, that at the same time, in the same period, there was internal debate within anthropological uh, archaeology, North American, to some extent British, um, internal debate about the, uh, the self-identified positivist new archaeology, self-identified scientific advocates for uh, scientific modes of practice in archaeology that had emerged in the late 60s, was influential through the 70s and 80s, continues to be a force in various ways. But internal critics of the period rejected the goals and explicitly uh, rejected the positivist commitments of this scientific new archaeology, countering their ambition that archaeology could or should aspire to being a universal science of humanity. On taken together, these, the indigenous activism critiques of uh, externally changing the conditions of practice and internal critiques uh, coalesced into this uh, movement to decolonize archaeology. I leave it to you to decide, maybe we can discuss this um, at, in the question and answer period, whether you think this counts, the kinds of decolonization that we're undertaking count as decolonization in a material rather than a metaphorical sense. Faced with these challenges, some archaeologists doubled down on the positivist commitments of the new archaeology, insisting that scientific understanding of the human cultural past is in the interest of, if not of interest to, all people and society as a whole. Some raised the ante, objecting that any capitulation to the parochial interests of descent communities, indigenous communities, is an abdication of enlightenment ideals. Uh, Jeff Clark put this in particularly vivid terms in a paper entitled Demon Haunted World. It was an, a, an irresponsible retreat to capitulate to indigenous claims was to retreat to a demon haunted world of ignorance and suspicion. And this is in face specifically repatriation claims, which he and others at the time feared would essentially put archaeologists and physical anthropologists out of work, essentially emptying the, the collections on which they rely. This overheated rhetoric is to be found not only among archaeologists defending the future of their field in the face of what they saw as potentially devastating loss of data and research opportunities, but also in the work of our own philosopher, Paul Bogosian. He opens Fear of Knowledge, his 2006 book, with an indictment of archaeologists who, as he's drawing on a New Yorker, story takes seriously the interests of indigenous communities on grounds that this opens the door to value-based bias and distortion in the name of misguided liberal commitments to epistemic pluralism. Now these critics renew a defense of the authority of science and scientific archaeology uh, as value-free, asserting, as Bogosian puts it, the universality of our goals and norms of justification as a self-evident, unassailable fact. Fact is Bogosian's term. What animates these arguments, which are always run at a high level of abstraction, is a palpable anxiety that if archaeologists didn't take a hard line defending the norms of their current science against the incursions of outsiders, there would be no stopping the slide into corrosive relativism. Generalized by, by, by Bogosian, this is an uncompromising defense of exactly the self-arrogated hegemonic authority, as Matova describes it, that advocates of epistemic decolonization reject. There's nothing on his account, there's uh, nothing for scientists to learn from knowledge systems and cultures that they define oppositionally in myriad boundary marking moves as non-scientific. By contrast, uh, a growing number of archaeologists at the time and continuing uh, have responded to indigenous demands for control over their cultural heritage um, 
with a commitment to reconfigure archaeology at the level of practice so that, as, as George Nicholas has put it, so that their, their work is, uh, benefits all parties. Minimally, this requires uh, that archaeologists consult with uh, descent communities, uh, indigenous communities, um, that they get their consent to do whatever they are going to do, that they do their work in respectful ways, respect traditional uh, protocols, um, and that they engage in some form of reciprocity. It could be uh, capacity building, training it, uh, with respect to archaeology, or often it takes the form of working with indigenous communities on projects of their own that don't necessarily have a lot to do with archaeology. Um, so this, this can leave the archaeology itself unchanged. It just ensures that it's undertaken in ways that respect the interests and protocols of non-archaeological stakeholders and gives something back to them. Often, however, initial steps toward benefiting all lead to working partnerships with stakeholders that have much more profound effects on the archaeology. And increasingly, archaeologists have been seeking to develop community-based collaborative practices that, and projects that are intended to reorient not only how they work, but also what they do, what their questions are, their research agenda, redirecting their efforts to questions that are relevant to partner communities and taking seriously their knowledge and expertise and answering them. It's striking that contra critics like Bogosian, uh, those engaged in this archaeological genre of CBPR, uh, say that they've never done better archaeology. Um, so a while back, uh, I was, as a philosopher, I was intrigued uh, and wanted to understand exactly what is better about this practice epistemically. What, what to, I wanted to think through its epistemic rationale. Here's one of the cases that I considered. It's published in a couple of places. I'll just briefly kind of mention it. Um, it's a case that started as a consultation when, in 1999, sheep hunters found human remains of a young man melting out of a high-level glacier in northern BC near the Yukon border. Uh, this was in uh, champaign Asiahik First Nations territory, CAFN territory. Um, so it started as a consultation, what was to be done with this uh, it's kind of emergency find. Um, and uh, the, uh, the short story here is that the CAFN wanted to say they wanted to know, the elders determined that they wanted to know as much as they could about this man. So they agreed to study of the remains co-managed by them and by British Columbia provincial authorities, museums and governmental authorities. Um, so it started as a matter of consultation uh, and, and uh um, systematic process for, for determining what could be done, what kind of research would be done. They recruited uh, an expansive scientific team uh, who got approval to address their questions using uh, a, a, an array of high-tech analyses. This was an amazing find. Turned out that this guy had died about 200 years ago, possibly caught in a snowstorm or fell down a crevice. Um, and with glacier melt, as I say, he was exposed, but he was fast frozen. So they were able to do a full autopsy. They did isotopic studies that made possible uh, dietary reconstruction of life, uh, of uh, dietary reconstruction for his lifetime and also for, his pre for the previous year. This was based on hair samples. Um, and the autopsy showed that although he'd eaten a marine diet for most of his life he'd, and had set out from the coast on his last trip, he had in fact lived in the interior for at least a year before he died. These trans-regional connections are also reflected in his kit. He had apparently gorgeous ground squirrel cape, ground squirrels only uh, from the interior, and a spruce root hat, which is distinctively coastal. The CAFN were responsible for ensuring that appropriate protocols were followed and they led the analysis of Kwade Danchinchi's belongings. Kwade Danchinchi means long ago person found. Um, they drew on a traditional knowledge, uh, oral tradition about long distance glacial travel, uh, about dietary practices and, and community relations uh, for these interpretations. The CAFN also wanted to know who should handle Kwade Danchinchi's memorialization. So they requested a community DNA study, um, which ultimately uh, resulted in the identification of 17 matrilineal descendants. What they wanted to know was which clan or lineage he, he was linked to. 
And I think all but two of the matrilineal descendants were wolf clan, um, people who live on the coast and in the interior. So that study answered the protocol question, but it was also welcomed as scientific confirmation of something the people, as was put in a, a news, news coverage in the Yukon paper, that people, the, the people have long known, and quoting that story, that the traditional ties between coastal Kling, Tlingit and people of the Southwest Yukon transcend artificial contemporary political boundaries. So what was gained? What, what was epistemically uh, positive about this uh, project? In addition to making systematic empirical scientific analysis possible, the, the indigenous partners directed attention in this case uh, to a range of primary evidence and brought to bear interpretive resources that archeologists might not, did not typically consider. They also raised questions about cultural affiliation that weren't on the re scientific researchers agenda that expanded the scope of the research and ultimately called into question a long-standing presupposition in law as well as ethnography and archeology span that indigenous peoples are geographically localized like little 19th century European states rather than being comprised of extended networks of family and clan affiliations with a web of use rights and trade relations that span the region. The results of the DNA study alongside all the other evidence of cross-region ties open space to bring a critical outsider's angle of vision to bear on norms of practice and framework assumptions that are, that are embedded in the, in the, um, in, in the art in art and frameworks of archaeological inquiry that in many cases they are so embedded in chronologies and cultural typologies that they're not even reckoned they're uh, that recognized they're taken for granted the conclusion i drew from cases such as this is that far from necessarily compromising the integrity and quality of the archaeology Engaging the situated values and interests of others, taking on board their ideas and knowledge often proves to be crucial to realizing the goal of producing knowledge we can trust as a reliable basis for action for understanding the world in at least two senses. One is constructive, they, plan, they stand to expand the scope of inquiry conceptually, empirically and methodologically, and crucially I would say in a critical sense collaborative engagements have the capacity to counteract the effects of groupthink within communities that all too easily come to see their distinctive, historically configured aims, substantive assumptions, and norms of justification as uniquely, universally, self-evidently the only right way to do science, to do inquiry. I've argued elsewhere, I won't uh, outline the details of this, that standpoint theory is a useful framework for articulating an epistemic rationale for collaborative partnerships that captures what they offer epistemically. Um, and I draw on uh, Helen Longino's account of social cognitive norms to fill out some of this. I mean, she's not a standpoint theorist, but I think there's um, her procedural account of, of norms that govern well-functioning research communities capture what's at stake here. I take it that this mode of response to internal and external critics like Clark and Bogosian resonates with Toby's arguments in his recent uh, paper for treating decolonization of knowledge as a non-relativist epistemic virtue. Uh, also with Hasek Chang's arguments, an uh, expanded version of his arguments for a metaphysically agnostic, active, normative, epistemic pluralism. If anything is central to and defining of science as a practice, I would argue it is a commitment to hold our assumptions open to critical scrutiny, including our norms of justi justification. We should not assume with Bogosian that these norms as captured by, to quote him, a classical Western scientific picture of knowledge uniquely approximate, quoting him again, absolute practice independent facts that define what will or should count for all as epistemic justification. Now, while I still think this is right, uh, it remains a resolutely inward facing, inward to the field as it were, uh, and defensive response. It risks legitimating research programs that may be more respectful, more committed to reciprocity, but are still nonetheless extractive, framed conceptually and methodologically in terms of dominant traditions of uh, archeological practice without necessarily changing those traditions. Although they have a material dimension, I doubt that they count as decolonizing in the senses articulated by Degla, 
Kutar, Tuck, and Yang. Maybe they're a step on the way, but I don't think they represent a decolonization of knowledge in this context. To invoke Christy Dotson's order of change, orders of change account, these collaborations may edge you toward realizing that third order framework change is required. For example, in the framework assumptions about indigenous peoples being localized, but they mainly improve the science in its own terms. In a series of uh, searing critiques of collaborative practice in archeology span that have appeared in the last decade, two archeologists at the University of Vancouver Island, they're in fact UBC alumni, Marina LaSalle and Rich Hutchings have raised these concerns in especially uncompromising terms and in terms that um, resonate with indictments of hollow misdirected attempts to decolonize that I mentioned at the outside, uh, outset. LaSalle and Hutchings uh, condemn collaborative community-based archeology span on grounds that this is just the same old practice dressed up in new language. The colonial culture of archeology span hasn't changed it is irrevocably a colonial technology of government designed to control living indigenous people by controlling their heritage. Whatever the good intentions or lofty ideals, the reality they argue is that institutional economic imperatives of late capitalism prevail, reinforced by training in Western traditions of archeology span that make it impossible to quote them, to think outside the box to affect real social change. Archeologists who think they can position themselves, again, quoting them as part of the solution, are at best deluding themselves and at worst actively harming those they purport to work with and for. If archeologists are serious about rectifying power asymmetries and helping indigenous people realize self-determination, they should give up doing archeology. span They should give up any claim to authoritative expertise and institute a program of planned obsolescence. Now there's much, this is again, a critique that's framed at a very general level with very little engagement with any of the particulars of the wide range of different kinds of practice that comprise uh, collaborative uh, archeology, span community-based collaborative archeology. span it's, it's overstated as an indictment of CBPR in archeology, span but LaSalle and Hutchings do identify inescapable risks uh, concerns that should be, and in fact are ever present in the minds, at least of those I know and work with, uh, the minds of those who are attempting to in some measure decolonize archeology. span Whether, Rather than withdraw to a position of seemingly unassailable political and moral integrity or purity, I'm compelled by the case that Alexis Shotwell makes in, in her book, Against Purity, Living Ethically in Compromised Times, for taking, as she puts it, complicity and compromise as a starting point for action. Just as there's no God's eye view to which we can ascend epistemically, I venture that a stance of disengagement offers a false sense of having escaped compromise and complicity. Better, Shotwell argues, to recognize that we are all implicated in systems and situations that we in some way, to some degree, repudiate. As Dela puts a related point, it's all too easy for settler colonial subjects to acknowledge past wrongs and even continuing legacies of dis excuse me, dispossession, but then, as she puts it, quickly flee, retreat, become defensive when asked to sit with that, uh, to, to, to sit with what it means to be more responsible and accountable to indigenous people given that they are occupying stolen lands. I suspect that as the antithesis to critiques that defensively reassert the authority of archeological science um, as unassailable, this may be another move, settler move to innocence. Perhaps CBPR and archeology span at its best is not decolonizing as such, but perhaps it can do some of what Michelle Degla calls for, activate a commitment to establish responsible relations with indigenous peoples that could be transformative, that could make a material difference. To close, I wanna briefly describe the work of a research cluster at UBC that I joined when I moved here, uh, that is moved to UBC, um, uh, in the Indigenous Science Project, Partnerships in the Exploration of History and, um, and Environments. Um, I don't know that these projects I'm going to describe are examples of decolonized knowledge production, but they are intended at least to take up the challenge of moving beyond the TRC recognition, the, the um, 
taking up the challenge posed by the TRC to move beyond recognition of uh, settler colonial uh, oppression and dispossession of indigenous peoples in Canada. It's led by Andrew Martindale, an archeologist, Dominic Weiss, a geochemist, and I've joined them as a philosopher. It's a consortium of UBC-based researchers committed to taking up, well, as I just said, this call, the TRC call to non-Indigenous Canadians to seek, quote, equitable, respectful, thoughtful, transparent relationships with Indigenous peoples. This being a primary means through which reconciliation may be advanced. So in this spirit, the, the mandate for this network and project was to reach out to First Nations communities. We, we In 2018-19, we reached out to half a dozen communities with whom one or another member of the cluster had already worked, outlined our, our collective research capabilities, and asked if our expertise might be useful to them. Um, this is just a, this is from a poster that uh, one of the, Ryan McMillan, whose work I will quickly get to, one of the lab-based um, members of the project developed. Um, what we have to offer is a range of expertise chiefly relevant to questions about indigenous histories of settlement and landscape use. It's a matter of determining what materials indigenous belongings were made of, where these originated and traveled, documenting patterns of cultural interaction and landscape use in material terms. Our claim was to pivot away from extractive modes of practice to find ways to put the tools of archeological science in service of indigenous defined questions. We fully expected to be told that the questions that geochemists and archeologists could address just weren't of interest. Indigenous communities have lots of other priorities. In the event, every community we spoke to had questions they wanted to discuss with us. Some are clearly relevant to rights and title claims. So they're instrumental to hopefully moving the dial in, uh, um, uh, in, in uh, legal cases and contestations. Others were of intrinsic interest. Um, indigenous peoples, the uh, communities we spoke to are, uh, are, are quick to say that they know their history. They don't need legitimation of Western science, but they also often acknowledge that there are things they don't know and that they'd be most interested in knowing. Uh, some details that the kind of work the geochemists and archeologists can do that will uh, put some flesh on the bones, will add some detail as, as some of them have put it. So here are two examples of projects now underway or taking shape. Um, as I say, I don't know whether these rise to the level of enacting a non-metaphorical commitment to decolonization, but there may be some useful lessons to draw from them. The first is a project that was developed with Musqueam that draws on expertise of the Pacific Center for Isotoping and Geochemical Research, PCIGR, um, which is directed by Dominic Weiss. Dominic is a volcanologist and has done a lot of work to develop uh, trace element and other profiles of, uh, volcanic, of volcanoes up and down the coast. Ryan McMillan, a recent PhD who works in her shop, has worked in her shop, uh, and Dominique outlined um, the kinds of analyses in a meeting with representatives of Musqueam uh, band, they outlined the kinds of analyses they could do specifically of obsidian belongings uh, that have been excavated decades ago and are held in a UBC located repository. There was a possibility that they could determine where the original volcanic glass came from, from which these, these belongings were made. Some analysis could be done using non-destructive technologies, but a much better fix on trace element composition, especially lead isotope ratios, could be realized if the Musqueam were willing to allow Rye to take tiny laser ablation samples. And here's his, these are to illustrate what the laser ablation samples look like. Um, this involved a great deal of uh, negotiation. Well, not a great deal. It involved considerable consultation. It was by no means a given that even if these little tiny pinprick samples uh, were not hardly visible to the eye, that it was not a given that uh, indigenous uh, Musqueam knowledge keepers and elders would agree to destructive uh, testing of this material, of these belongings. In the end, they did agree. Um, and the, the, this was consultation with the head, the Musqueam head archaeologists, knowledge keepers, and elders. And using a multivariate approach, Rye was able to situate the archaeological belongings in a north-south trend um, 
uh, radiogenic lead isotope ratios, the kind of baseline data that Dominique has developed over the years, characteristic of volcanic uh, geological obsidian sources from Alaska down to Oregon. Now, with this kind of study, you can't ever re render like a, a postcode positive verdict. It had to come from here, but you can eliminate uh, sources. And essentially, the, uh, the upshot of the study was that they eliminated all the sources close to Musqueam. Um, it looks like uh, this, what I'm showing you here are, are um, images from a, from a recent methodological article, but it looks like some, and it very carefully doesn't specify exactly where the site is from which the material was derived that they tested. Um, but it looks like some obsidian belongings uh, uh, may have originated as much as a thousand kilometers south and east from Musqueam settlements on the coast here. This is an exciting result, uh, documents social connections across the region that like the historical continuities finally established archeologically at Cessna Am, have been read out of archeologically grounded narratives. And indeed out of the conceptual armature of typologies and chronologies that stru structure archeological practice. The second project is a very different, uh, is, is very different from this one. Um, the, it's uh, work with Penelicut, a community, indigenous community whose reservation lands include Penelicut Island, formerly known as uh, Cooper Island, just north, just east of Nanaimo, where a particularly notorious residential school was located. And it was actually, the name of it was the Cooper Island Indian Industrial School. Survivors of the school say that they, uh, it, they, they, they were not, uh, educated in any sense. I mean, they often ended up uh, barely literate as a, or some of them as a consequence of essentially being put to work uh, in an industrial, in this industrial, agricultural industrial setting. This school was run by missionary Oblates of Mary Immaculate. It opened in 1889. Students set fire to the school in 1896. And in that year, um, a survey and, and a sort of audit of the school showed that 107 students of 264 had died. Others were later acknowledged uh, to have committed suicide or drowned trying to escape. The federal government took over the administration of uh, Cooper IRS in 1975 and uh, in, sorry, yeah, it was, well, sorry, it was closed in 1975 in, the, in its last decade, it was taken over by the federal government. Former attendees have spoken out publicly about pervasive violence and sexual abuse. In 1995, a priest who ran the school for a number of years was tried and convicted of sexual assault and indecency. With just, within just a few years of school closure, the Penelicate Nation dismantled the main building, most of the outbuildings and threw them into the harbor. So this, the entry to the the entry to the school or the dock that takes you, would have taken you up to the entry to the school. There's a dock still there, uh, but this whole complex, the building and all the uh, construction features in the front of it are just have disappeared. In 2012, a documentary, Return to the Healing Circle, uh, appeared. It was widely influential in breaking the code of silence that surrounded these abuses. Uh, and it, uh, it, it's exactly the kind of documentation that was central to the uh, speaking truth documentation that was central to the TRC process. An ongoing concern for the Penelicate is that they do not know where the children who died at the residential school are buried. There's only one formal cemetery and the only markers there are for staff who were interred uh, on the island. Many children were evidently interred in unmarked clandestine graves. The process of community healing, the Penelicate say, requires that they be memorialized. And with these graves at risk of disturbance, there's an increasingly urgent sense that they need to be located and the necessary spiritual work undertaken. At the invitation of the Penelicate, Andrew Martindale undertook ground penetrating radar survey of known cemeteries, including the one with, uh, with the uh, the IRS staff, which is was down around here, um, in 2014, 2016, and he was ground truthing or testing the uh, the GPS setup. Um, but he also found uh, 
a number of unmarked child-sized graves in a row behind the known graves of IRS staff. So in 2018-19, we offered to use this field technique to check for clandestine graves and areas planned for development by the Penelicate Nation. And at the invitation of the elders and under direction of band members, we surveyed a couple of areas that had been cleared for development. This project, even though this is at the invitation of the Penelicate, it, uh, developing it has been an extended uncertain process. We've met half a dozen times with elders committee, with chief and council, and the questions we are asked signal just how sensitive this work is. Could we be trusted not just to find the missing children, but to actually follow through, not come and do a little bit and disappear. Do the work in a good way, with a good heart. What positive vision could we have to work together was the question posed often at the end of these meetings. Reflecting on this experience, we've come to think of the work we do in terms of bearing witness with reference points in both uh, Coast Salish and Euro-Canadian settler traditions. As an established practice and formal role in Coast Salish cultures, witnesses are called to, to bear witness to what is done at uh, important ceremonies, legal and social uh, dimensions of ceremonies, with responsibility to carry the news of the proceedings back home and into the future. Now, we haven't been called as witnesses in any formal traditional sense, but when we undertake GPR surveys at Penelicat, there is a sense in which we feel we're bearing witness to the history of the IRS indirectly, material witnesses. When invited to formal meetings of the elders committee to discuss what GPR has to offer and how we should proceed, we're also witness to direct testimony of survivors and community members who are who themselves survivors of the school and by community members affected by intergenerational trauma. When we're on Penelicate territory, we're also acutely aware that we are ourselves witnessed continuously appraised as to our motives and integrity, what we know, what we don't know of, a, of a protocols that are appropriate in the context, what blunders we're likely to make, how we'll take criticism or direction, how deeply ingrained discriminatory prejudices of settler society are in us, whether we'll hear their telling of the history of the residential school sympathetically. So we think of this as a kind of reciprocal witnessing. And finally, the TRC calls, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission calls on all Canadians to serve as witnesses, to quote them, to store, care for, and share the history you witness, uh, share it with your own people when you return home. Although this role comes with considerable risks of all the kinds familiar to working allies, the expectation seems to be that we will convey what we learn to our own predominantly settler communities and institutions. Mindful of LaSalle and Hutchins' critique of the questions, uh, the questions we wrestle with are, how do we bear witness without reinscribing settler colonial systems of oppression, speaking for, speaking of, certainly not speaking as, but the risks are there uh, when speaking for or of. And crucially, how do we act to change the institutions within, we, within which we work? Most immediately, the funding mechanisms, which do not support this kind of work systems of expectation and reward that powerfully reinforce extractive modes of research practice. Again, which will not recognize this as, as uh, creditable archeological or other uh, scholarly work. So um, I close just with um, some uh, advice from practice for practice. Um, generic advice from the archeological literature on collaborative practice emphasizes the need to develop sufficient mutual understanding to trust one another in a working relationship. Um, this can usually, yeah, I think this can be uh, usefully understood in terms of uh, Collins and Evans's character, a version of Collins and Evans's characterization of interactional expertise. You grasp enough about your research partner's practice and expertise to communicate about it with them, even though you lack their contributory expertise. Indigenous communities have considerable interactional expertise with respect to settler colonial society and science. It's the scientists, it's the academics uh, who need to recognize uh, the value of their expertise with, um, with respect to their own cultural goals and interests and uh, our own. Their uh, indigenous knowledge and ideas, values and social norms, especially the histories and social political contexts in which these partnerships take shape are things that 
uh, need to be developed as the ground for interactional expertise. Other standard advice is to cultivate uh, sufficient humility to recognize that you have something to learn, uh, to build the kind of self-awareness and other awareness uh, that's necessary to cultivate what uh, two archeologists working, uh, Greer actually works on Penelicate Island, um, have, uh, have described as horizontal relationships in which each partner can effectively recognize and draw on the knowledge and skill and experience of each one another. In the case of the Musqueam, this is relatively straightforward. It's not entirely straightforward, but there are formal framework agreements with the university and that will be developed, that are developed around the work that any archeologist or other scholar does with, with, the, with the Musqueam. They employ professional archeologists over decades of sustained, if sometimes rocky interaction, they've established a robust relationship with a number of archeologists, several of them at UBC. This is also documented, or it grows out of the history that Roy uh, develops, that Roy has published. At Penelicate, the history that frames our engagement is one of repeated disappointment and betrayal. And given the trauma associated with the Cooper Island IRS, the Penelicate expressed well-warranted concern that despite goodwill, we may not be able to take up the task entrusted to us in the right way. We just don't understand enough of the relevant cultural and spiritual protocols. Um, they fear that ultimately we will serve ourselves and not the community. So uh, as two examples, the question I put on the table is whether this is work of decolonizing, decolonizing archeology, archeological knowledge production. I think it does embody a commitment to work out what Degla refers to as responsible relations with indigenous peoples in this particular corner of a settler, colonial settler state. Some of this work has potential to be legally consequential, possibly to uh, uh, support um, claims to self-determination, sovereignty with material uh, that come with material change. But to go beyond enacting intentions, we need to make, as I've said, major changes in institutional and disciplinary cultures. Um, so I don't have a lot to say about exactly what this means for philosophy of science, but just thinking through the various um, elements of this talk, I identify a few. First of all, we need to be really clear if we're, we aim at decolonizing our own field or helping to decolonize knowledge, exactly what kind of colonialism we're dealing with, what the non-metaphorical stakes are. I think we need to reckon, reckon with complicity, uh, be uh, particularly with moves to innocence. Um, comparing the two examples I gave, cases, projects in, at the very end of this talk, partnerships are crucial, but I think they can't be treated as an endpoint. They don't themselves constitute decolonization. They may, as Degla puts it, activate responsible relationships that change settler colonial systems at a structural material level, but they're not an endpoint. Expect to be unsettled, sit with that. That's a recurrent theme in our meetings with Penelicate and Musqueam and other indigenous communities. And then I've identified a couple of uses of philosophical skills, uh, inward looking, contest self-arrogated hegemonic authority as articulated by the likes of Bogosian as legitimated within philosophy and by philosophy and build counter narratives that capture the contingency of entrenched scientific goals and norms of justification. So that's, that's all. Thank you.